So, uh, Tom, thank you very much for joining us for this virtual Villeville Vest conference. Um, for those who are foolish and ignorant, uh, could you perhaps briefly uh, introduce your, uh, yourself to all of us, please? Um, sure. I'm, um, my name's Tom Gray. I'm a, a primarily I'm a songwriter and composer. Um, people might remember my band Gomez, who won the Mercury Prize many years ago. And I compose for television and theatre and things like that. But uh, in more recent years, I've become more involved in sort of uh, artist rights and composer rights. And I'm a director of PRS for Music, who are the, uh, the, the collection agency for, for songwriters in the UK. And I'm also a director of the Ivers Academy, who are uh, a sort of professional organization for songwriters in the UK who, who give out the Ivers Awards as well. And I work with a few other organizations like the Musicians Union, and the Featured Artist Coalition. And I started a campaign in the past few months called the Broken Record Campaign that has become somewhat bigger than me. Um, um, so, and that's, which is really, which is about, you know, the problem for me, what I see as being a, an issue with the way that streaming pays artists and songwriters and the entire music economy and how it's essentially failing us. So, I mean, I do have to ask, is it, was it your experience with Gomez, particularly perhaps in the early days, I think when you had problems with Hutt being sort of closed down by Virgin, is that what kind of alerted you to the problems of, uh, of remuneration and artist rights and such like? The truth is, is actually that I, the reason why I kind of arrived at this moment is because I, before I was in a band, I, I was very engaged in politics and was that thought I thought that was what I was going to do with my career with my life um and and was on a course for doing that when I signed a record contract with my mates from home and became a, a and became a successful recording artist um and but because of the connections that I had in politics predating music I had a sort of epiphany a few years ago where I realized that there was probably not many people like me who who both had a very long and, um, you know, um, mixed career in music and in and in the different ways that music can be applied uh, and monetized, but also sort of can get quite well-known British politicians on the phone if I need to because because I know them. So it's kind of it's it's sort of curious because I, I never wrote political music. That wasn't that was really far from. The last thing that I wanted to do, really. Um, but as a person, I felt like I had a responsibility to join the dots. That's really well, the story of why I'm here. Well, it does seem that you've, uh, that with this, uh, the whole hashtag broken record campaign, you seem to have sort of found your niche, so to speak. Um, could you perhaps sort of briefly summarize the sort of specific things to, that, that broken record is trying to address? Um, Broken Record was specifically born out of a moment. We, 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 were, we were at the beginning of COVID and lockdown, and I had a realization that live mute money, you know, live income was going to disappear, and it was going to be it disappear indefinitely. And we're still in that situation now, four or five months later. And I, obviously, being a PRS director, but was acutely aware that licensing income, which is the money that songwriters and performers earn from music being played in premises and bars and restaurants and hairdressers and things like that, that that was going to disappear as well. And it's like, well, wait a minute, what is the source of income here? And because what I, you know, what's happened over the past decade or more, two decades is we have abandoned recorded music as an income stream. We have accepted that, it's not something that makes money for musicians. What we've done is we've said, it's a sort of loss leader for playing gigs, which is amazing because 30 years ago, most successful musicians would have massively made more money from their recorded music than they would have done from their performances. Um, so I realized that an awful lot of musicians were gonna be in an awfully hard position and, I, and, I, and, I, and I've, I've long felt that it makes no sense that that Spotify and Apple and all these other companies can make billions 
and we've accepted that musicians don't make any money from recorded music. I mean, that is just curious and makes no sense. And it's, it's, it's a business model which is founded on the idea that musicians should be happy to give away their content. That's, that is literally where we are. And like, hooray, they saved the day, they saved us from the pirates. Well, I, I mean, it's very hard to find a musician who is like, who has this position where we're really glad that they came along and saved us from the pirates. It's just, it's ridiculous. There's, I mean, I think Spotify just announced themselves that only 1% of all the artists that are on their platform are making more than like 50,000 quid from their work, which is not to say that 40,000 people are making 50,000 pounds from their work because that just means their work is generating that income. If they have a record label, 80% of it might be going to a record label or 50% of it might be going to a record label unless they're fully independent, which is fairly unlikely. And then there's management who you pay 20% to and then there's tax. So, I mean, if you take 50,000 pounds, you take 80% away and then you take another 20% away and then you take another 20% away. If you're lucky enough to be in that 1%, you might be making 10,000 pounds a year from your music. And that's as a band who might then and, need and to split then it. If you're in a band, then you divide that by five. I mean, it's, it's insane. It's kind of a tangent, but I do think, you know, we talk about uh, the, the, the illegal downloading has been sort of, you know, the year zero, so to speak, of the new system or whatever. But I don't think enough responsibility has been taken by the record label for the fact that, you know, for the preceding 10 years minimum, they'd been giving away music for free as cover mount CDs and cover mount cassettes. And that kind of prepared people for this idea that music was free. They already had the radio, which they weren't paying for, really. So this is a problem that, as I think you mentioned earlier, it's kind of systemic within the entire system that musicians are just under uh, undervalued. Well, absolutely. I mean, this is... Uh, in the 20th century, we had the problem of the standard record deal already. You know, the, the, I don't know if people who are watching this know how a recoupment deal works, but a, a, a basic music recoupment deal is, 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 goes like this. Here's a bit of money <laughs> to do something. Um, and we're going to give you a royalty rate of, say, 15 or 20%. And once you've, we've, you've, once you've spent that money and we start selling your record, we're going to earn that money back not from the profits, but from your royalty, from your 15 or 20%. So you could have made our company many, many tens of thousands. We could have made our money back you 10 times over and you're still in debt to us. And that is the basics of how the major record labels are still working and even some of the big indies. So it's, it's so unethical at its very base. Yeah. <laughs> that that is still going on. Let's be clear, there are, are record companies in the world who do profit share deals. It's called a profit share deal. And guess how that works? They give you, they give you a bit of money and they give, you a, they give you a royalty rate, whatever that is, could still be 15 or 20%. And then when the profits come in and those profits pay off whatever they gave you, then everybody starts earning money together. Sounds incredibly uncomplicated to me. And yet that is not what's happening and they've never been held to account for that um and that's one of those disgusting i mean some i, I mean it is one of those how do you sleep things about the major labels because it's just wrong <laughs> um, and of course you what they've done is then they've taken that the, the that that way of doing business and applied it to the streaming market so now there's these artists who have I mean, there's artists like me who have mass historical debt from 30 years ago. It's just for whom it's just ridiculous. But then there's kids now coming in, this, they, they, they sign. Um, and there's these tiny fragments of money coming in of which only 20% of that tiny fragment is paying off their debt to the, com the company. So they're never going to not be in debt. The only way they're ever going to earn money from record companies is through advances. And... And, and that's it. They'll never actually earn money from their work. It's, I mean, it's deeply exploitative. It's deeply wrong. It shouldn't be happening anymore. 
Um, it, and one of the big problems we have, of course, is, is that when you go to like government or you go to like competition authorities or around the world or whatever, they go, well, and you say, well, this is a problem. I've identified a problem. It's a broken market. These things shouldn't be happening. These people have too much power. They are, it's, it's, it's massively asymmetric uh, uh, negotiation. They have all this power over these young artists. They shouldn't be able to do that. Um, they say, well, what was happening 20 years ago? And you go, well, the same thing. And they go, well, we can't change it then. It's like, it's like because it's always been a problem. Nobody thinks that you need to sort it out. And it's, and this has been the sort of interesting part of this journey has been learning how legislators and uh, economists and all these different people haven't been hearing from the creators at all. They've been hearing from lobbyists for the major labels. They've been hearing from, you know, managers um, who have unfortunately an interest in the advanced system because they get more money up front and they don't they it, you know it, it their little gamble of getting a big chunk of money just for them works out better um so it's it's been really interesting kind of going right well it's not just this isn't just like having to talk about a specific problem with streaming or talk about like some little inequity in some deals or some hidden, the, the, the problem is having to explain the whole thing from top to bottom and how many, uh, where, whatever, whichever layer you get into in the cake, you realize how horrible and exploitative it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's funny because one description I read of the campaign simply said, it exists to help musicians understand exactly what they should be getting angry about. And you you do seem to be unusually articulate in the, it, it, firstly on social media and also in person in being able to explain that. Why do you think it's taken so long for somebody like yourself to actually get up there and be able to articulate this anger and therefore create what seems to be a growing wave of dissatisfaction that actually has some kind of impact? Um. I just, I just don't know. Um, I just don't know the answer to that question. I, I think a lot of creatives don't um, necessarily familiarise themselves with the business all that much, or have the capacity to, or the desire to, because you know it's different kinds of intelligence, isn't it? This is the problem that we have in the creative world. A mo a, like probably fifty percent of my musician friends are heavily dyslexic. You know, that's not something people talk about very often. A lot of them have, you know, ADHD. A lot of them have, um, uh, are, you know, would even describe themselves as being on the spectrum in some way. Um, and so it's, 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 it's not, yeah, it's not always easy for people to, to engage in this way and to want to talk in this way and to want to think in this way. Um, and to be honest with you, you know, I, it's, it, it's, it's more born out of a, a strange sense of social responsibility in me than it is anything else. You know, I've been working in the background with a lot of organizations for a long time. I've not, I hadn't, I hadn't, I hadn't thought that I would be somebody standing at the front. And I know that it's shocked a lot of people. I speak to quite famous musicians uh, quite a lot now about this. And they're always, and it's, there's always this little funny moment where they're like, why is the bloke from Gomez? Like, like what, what is going on? And I'm like, I don't know. I really don't know. But what I've realized is that by being able to talk about it in this way and articulate it in this way, what it's doing is it's actually breaking out into other areas and other areas of people who are getting very interested in it. So I'm, I'm now talking to quite serious economists and people who are interested in competition law who have taken an interest in it. I'm talking to investment bankers and people who run pension funds who have taken an interest in it. I'm talking, you know, so it's not just, I think the problem has been in the past that it's always about musicians getting angry or musicians shaking their fists or all wanting to like protest. And I'm like, this isn't a protest. This is a very calm, deliberate argument. Every musician I talk to, without exception, is earning less than they've ever earned in their career. Where is that money going? 
Because I don't think it's just going into the pockets of the streaming platform. No, it's not. No. Although it is, you know, I mean, let's just deal with that first. Streaming platforms are taking between 25 and 35%, sometimes 35% in the case of Spotify with some of the deals they do with certain record labels. Um, for what? What are they taking that money for? F for owning a server? For writing a playlist? Have you written a playlist? I've written a playlist. Um, the, 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 the five wealthiest people in Sweden, four of them are Spotify executives. Um, uh, the, like, okay, so they're doing all right. They're not doing badly at this. There's, there's always this thing, you know, Spotify still aren't profitable. It's like, yeah, except they're holding two billion in cash in cash reserves, and they've done half a billion dollars worth of, of stock buybacks in the past 12 months. Not profitable. No, no profit. Of course, no bloody profit if you keep basically buying yourself back with every penny that you make. But anyway, let's ignore that. And setting that aside, then you have the major labels, and none of us know what their deals with the platforms look like. And we don't know if money's going around the side. We don't know if it's going around the middle. We don't know if it's going straight into people's pockets. We don't know what's happening. The way they've set the deals up, the way the whole thing's been set up has been like, is, is like this. A record company takes its entire catalog and it licenses it to a platform. And because it's set up in this way, all of the different big labels and the big major independent distributors as well, who have millions of labels who put their money through, uh, their money, put their music through that distributor. They do these big licensing deals that are in competition with each other. So, you, so they say, well, this is commercially sensitive. I can't see your licensing deal because if I could see that, I could get paid the same, or I could get paid fast for more, or I could, you know, whatever. But there's no reason for those it to be dealt, done in that way. There's no reason for us to have licensing deals. When musicians aren't paid like it's a license, we're paid like it's a sale, right? We get paid per pro rata, which if I'm being paid like it's a sale, how come you're being paid like it's a license? Here's what could happen, right? Is that all of the plays by any label or anyone could all get paid at the same rate, right? But, but that's, not, that's not what's happening. Um, so because of these deals, because of the secrecy around these deals, we can't, we have no way of knowing what is happening. And, and artists aren't allowed to audit to find out what's happening with their own work and their own money. And if they do audit, if they're wealthy enough to be able to audit, which you know, because most of us have got auditing rights on some level, but to do a full audit is a very expensive process, especially if you're doing like a forensic audit, which could cost tens of thousands of pounds. And if you're making 20p a month from Spotify, hey, it's not <laughs> doable. <laughs> um, so if you do do an audit, <laughs> if you do do an audit and you find something that the record company is doing something dodgy, right? you're not allowed to tell other artists because of NDAs. But, wow. Yeah. So if you discover that they're like basically chucking cash in an ex escrow account in Geneva, um, then, <laughs> then you're not allowed to tell anyone else or you'll get sued. Major labels are hugely complex businesses and have you know all these different labels in different countries. Now, what used to happen was sort of export built-in costs. So if my label over there bought so many from me, what I would do is I would charge myself money for doing that. So like, hey, Universal Germany is gonna buy some records off Universal UK or whatever like that. Now, what we don't know is how much of that is going on as well within streaming. So they're like, they are, they are, as the money is traveling through their global system, they are using the fact that they have all of these national entities to keep putting service charges on and taking, scooping money out as it travels back to the, to, to, to the top. So, and we can't see any of that. I mean, this is, it, it, what's, this is what's so incredible about the internet is the internet was supposed to disintermediate. It was supposed to get rid of the middleman. 
right? But amazingly in music, we've ended up with more middlemen than ever before. It's almost like you can't, the musician is just this little thing under a pile of middlemen, just, 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 just killing us. It, it feels a little bit like listening to you describe all of this the last couple of minutes or so, it, it feels a little bit like somebody explaining to me how Donald Trump's business empire works. We all know it's flawed, probably corrupt, certainly dubious, and yet still he continues to do business. And that it feels a little bit like that with the music industry. It's full of incompetent, corrupt people. Sorry to all of those who work in the music industry who are watching this, but there are a lot of very, very dubious practices going on but we can't seem to change it unless Broken Record comes in to rescue us all. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I would love to change it, but the truth is, is I, I very much doubt that I can. I mean, we, we are massively stacked to get, like I say, we're, it's, it's a deeply entrenched system. It's very, you know, I, I've been saying this like to friends, like in the, uh, especially to friends in the Black Lives Matter movement um, um, and black creators who are like, well, where are the black executives? You know, what we need to do? And I'm excited, well, what? there's a bigger problem here. Like how, how can you have these companies which have become enormously wealthy off the back of exploiting black artists for over half a century and like really exploiting them, basically yeah. ripping them off, right? And that is, that is the ground on which these companies are built. And then you want to put a black person at the top of that company but without sorting any of this stuff out. I mean, it doesn't, it's like, what? I don't, it doesn't make any sense. It's like, the, you've, got to, you've got to sort out this stuff. You've got to get rid of, you've got, to, you've got to get rid of historic debt. You have to forgive all of this stuff and get people out of these exploitative contracts that you've had people trapped in for half a century. You've got to get rid of that stuff and then black people should feel comfortable going into the executive offices of these companies. Because I don't even, I don't know how any, I don't know how the, the, the white people, the old white men who are sitting in those offices right now sleep at night. So, I you know, I, it's not, it's, it's, it's just not pretty. You're right. It's, it's a total bloody mess. And um, it does need to be addressed. Um, which is why, you know, I spend a lot of time talking, and now I'm spending a lot of time talking to politicians. Um, Are the politicians actually paying attention? Um, so, so, I mean, certainly I've had a lot of success with the, with the opposition party in the UK. Um, they're very, very on board um, and uh, supportive because they get it. Because once it, they click that, that basically it's, it's workers getting screwed. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, right, yeah, that sounds familiar. Um, uh, <laughs> we know about that. And, and because people are still on, suffering under this illusion that we are work, that musicians are in some way glamorous um, and are not sort of worker bees who are having to, like, you know, every, every young musician I know now who is succeeding on any level, and even when I say succeeding, they're probably still got, another job but like doing well you may even know their music you've probably heard it um they are the most committed like entrepreneurial fighting every minute of their life to create content and to 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 to, to um you know uh, you know work social media and constantly produce all of this work and constantly being present and constantly having to engage with their fans i've never seen people work like this they work in like it makes me feel guilty you know and 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 <laughs> and they earn nothing for it and the other thing is that what no one's actually saying is they don't earn anything from touring either this is what's really 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 messed up because people, well, they, I was going to say, from touring, they don't make their money from touring either. So, so, so how did you how did you feel when Daniel X said uh, not so long ago uh, to musicians, essentially in an interview, uh, you can't record music once every three to four years and think that that's going to be enough? Um, how did you feel? Because to me, that struck me as kind of bizarre. In that one 
musicians have been told to tour as much as they possibly can. So I don't really see how they can come up with a great deal more music. And secondly, the record labels don't want more music. Any musician I know who's recorded 20 songs has been told, look, you're going to have to wait at least 18 months to put the second 10 out. The funny thing about that, Daniel gave those comments when he was asked about my campaign, which is... <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I mean, thanks for doing my job for me, Daniel. Um, but like, <laughs> if you're watching, um, but um, it, 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 yeah, it is ridiculous. I mean, he, he clearly, it's the most tone deaf thing he could possibly have said. And what was funny and was curious about it is my friend Stuart um, Dredge, who writes for Music Ally, had, was the person who did that interview. And he, even Stuart, who's a music journalist, hadn't realized how tone deaf it was. Because if you're not a musician, you won't realize how awful of a thing it was to say. Because it's not only that we haven't got time because we, we've got other jobs and, you know, we've got, and, and, we've, and we're touring all the time because that's the only way we can theoretically make money to sell bloody t-shirts. And then, um, you know, it's, it's, not all of, it's not just all of that. We've got to keep putting out music. And it's not just him describing us as basically content providers for his service, which is like, oh, so we just service stuff to you so that you can have more stuff on your thing. That's, that's really all we are to you. It was the fact that he didn't realize that with music, it is only ever quality over quantity we don't make it by the yard daniel it's it's we, we we devote ourselves to trying to create something genuinely beautiful most of the time and achieving that is very fucking hard and and and, and, and having daniel x say just make more of it just do more of it all day long so I, 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 i'm sure he wouldn't mind me telling you this story but he probably wouldn't mind me telling the story. Anyway, I won't tell you who it was. Very famous British indie musician, lead singer of a band, rings me up as soon as he hit, reads that interview. And he's like, yeah. I, he goes, I think what we should do is we should record an 80 song album and ev the lyrics to every single song should be baby, 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 with the occasional O oh in it, just O, oh, baby, 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 baby. It's just 80 songs of us saying baby, baby, baby over the top. And we, we'll, we'll do it in a week and we'll call it like Daniel X Whack Dream or something like that. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> because I mean, like, it's, what, is that what you want, Daniel? You just want loads and loads of shit music. You just want, because <laughs> here's the thing, just forget us, stop paying us all together. Just go and get some AI to write all of the music for you now, because that's clearly what you want, because you'd be a lot happier if that was what was happening. So just go and do it. Just stop pretending that you want, go, go back to your, your governance of your company and strike out that line about making a million creators actually be able to live have a living because that's not going to happen for 85 years by my calculations and and why pretend that you want to do it anyway because it's just he doesn't he doesn't he doesn't even know what a musician is mm. so how the hell is he running a music company it's it's yeah i mean it, it was utterly embarrassing and, and and you probably saw some of the comments from david crosby and uh, and uh, what do you call him I, I, well, I, the one I enjoyed was Mike Mills. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> nice. Yeah, just go fuck yourself. I think it's, it's quite funny because, like, I, I've been really, really careful to say to people, look, it's not just Spotify. It's not just Spotify's fault. It's not just the platforms. You don't blame them. This is all of this other stuff going on. It's to do with the licensing arrangements. It's to do with how those licensing arrangements work, the way that we're paid. None of this needs to be happening. There's other models, there's other systems. But instead, and, 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 and try and get people out of this, like, fuck Spotify headspace. And then Daniel Ek comes along, right? And just sets fire to the whole thing. It's just like, oh, God, you idiot. It, it strikes me that they haven't got any musicians in the room. They just haven't got them in the room. And, and that's one of the biggest problems they've got. I mean, they haven't got a musician on their board. They haven't got, it's just not part of their culture. Music is not part of the culture of Spotify. 
the thing that I I was interested in is, is this this weird little space of money that doesn't seem to go anywhere. I think you know they're called what black box payments, for instance. Black box. <laughs> <laughs> black box uh relates to publishing and uh publishing is about 13 percent of the total uh, streaming revenue which relates to the copyright that is produced from writing a song as opposed to the master right which is the recording of the song now the record labels and and and, and distributors are usually working with the master right the recording and there's this there's this extra right here that's producing income for the songwriter now Within this system, none of the data talks to it, each other. It, there's no like one set of data that represents one song. So, so, so the songwriter over here has to register a piece of data here about I wrote a song to earn my 10% on that song. And the record company has its own set of data uh, and coding for how it recognizes its piece of work within the system. But the two things don't join together, right? So a song can be played tens of thousands of times and the record company's getting paid and there's this bit of money that's flying off into the publishing pool, but nobody knows who it belongs to because the piece of data that joined those two things together has been misfiled, it's been written in wrong. There's no, there's no control over this. There's no, it's never been regulated for to make sure that that line of data is always the same that this metadata is it is in 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 tech world is is clear and is cohesive and uh, and is unitary now so what happens is a, a lot of money just get, goes goes to collection societies which is who the people who collect the um the songwriter right and distribute it to publishers and songwriters they get this money and they don't know who it belongs to. And they've got no way of finding out who it belongs to, right? And that, for, they, they keep it for a while because people, there's like a statute of limitations on, on it and go, well, whose is this? Uh, does anyone want to claim it? Anyone got any data that wants to, you know? And then after a while, they have to distribute it. And that's when it sort of becomes what's known as black box because the only method, and this is, the, this is completely top to bottom throughout the record industry, how this works. How do you distribute income when you don't know who it belongs to? Well, let's just do it based on consumption share. Let's just do it based on market share. So whoever's the biggest gets the chunk of the money. Here's the biggest, you, oh, you're universal publishing, you're massive, you have, you know, you're 30% of the global music market. So here's 30% of the, the money that we don't know who it belongs to anybody. They don't go, you know, what should we do with this money? We should put it into cultural funds. We should invest in, in our communities and our cities. We should build rehearsal studios for young musicians. We should, a thousand things that we could do with this money. Instead, we give it to the people who've already got loads and loads of money. But here's the curious thing. If you actually do, if you do research into most people who are losing their income, they tend to be independents who, 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 who don't know how to fill the forms improperly, don't know how to register, have made mistakes, have, have done it wrong, have followed a wrong protocol, the, me the metadata's got lost somewhere, and yet their work is producing money that's going into the pocket of, that's going into the black box. And it's very unlikely in the case of a big publisher that, that, that any of that income would, would relate to them because it's, it's their business to make sure that their data is right because that's how they make money. The solution that is being put forward most prominently at the moment is something called user-centric uh, uh, payments, I believe, or user-centric streaming or whatever the phrase is. I should know as the interviewer. Um, what do you make of that? Will it work? How does it work? Three big questions. <laughs> um, well, user-centric payment, um, or right. sometimes called user, sometimes called UCPS or just UCS, um, depending on you. But you, but you're right in both uh, cases. Um, is instead of all of the money going into one big pot and being shared out based on total listens, what happens is an individual's you, an individual user's subscription fee is just divided up amongst what that individual listener listens to, which is what most people who 
I, after having spoken to a lot of people now, I can say this, obviously I've not done the research, but most people think that that's what's happening already. They think that all of their money just goes to what they listen to. What they don't realize is, is that's not happening. Their money just goes off into a big pool over here. And then all of the plays in the system are paid out pro rata. Now, what that means is for the average user is that well, well over half of your subscription fee is not going to music that you listen to most of the time. If you're listening to under 750 tracks, maybe even a thousand tracks a month, most of your subscription fee is going to music you don't listen to. Right now, that's that's a shocking real, a realization for most consumers, um, because obviously, I mean, in music we would call that moral rights, but I guess you just call it consumer rights. You expect, you, I don't. When I put money into a system, I don't expect that money to be going to things that I don't like. I don't want to fund misogynistic hip hop. I don't want to fund um, certain kinds of, you know. Uh, a pop that 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 does my head in i don't want to you know um it's it, it's 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 just the the way of it but that's what's happening so what ucps does is absolutely restores consumer rights over how their money uh, over how their money is spent but it also the thing for me is why it's so attractive is that it breaks up the existing licensing system <laughs> and because that's the, the big, ugly monster in the room. If, if we move to user-centric, but we stick with the licensing deals that we have, it won't improve anything. That's, it has to be that everything gets paid just apportioned by what comes from the user. And it can't be that Universal's music gets paid more or less, or Warner's music gets paid more or less or a big indie like beggars or whatever their music gets paid music gets paid more or less it just gets paid based on what the user listens to and what people say now here's the thing I don't think it solves the remuneration problem it solves it a little bit if you look at all of the data and there isn't a lot of it there is a, there was quite a well-known Norwegian study I think but um but there isn't a lot of data on on this what what we have seen is that maybe 5% gets taken off the very top and spread across the middle, which is no bad thing, a, a little bit of a redistribution of wealth. Um, but it doesn't solve remuneration of artists. Um, that is not why I am so attracted to it. I am attracted to it because it brings down the walls of Jericho, right? It, 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 everything gets smashed to bits and, it, and a new system comes in. And of course, when a new system comes in, the opportunity arises to renegotiate everything. And that is what we need. I think that primarily what we have to do is what's best for music. And right now, music is, you know, in about as bad a health as it could possibly be, um, even though it appears to be an incredibly profitable, growing economy. Why is it that people are resistant to this idea? Um, because they like it when they're making money and they don't like change it. They don't like change. And it's, it's, it's as simple as that. It's just inertia. It's, a, it's market inertia. I mean, I've seen some of the numbers and most of the major labels would come out making the same amount of money anyway. I mean, if you own 70% of all the music in the world, it doesn't really make any difference how you pay it out because it's still going to be, 70% of it's still going to get paid, right? It's just going to be less consistent and it's going to be less easy to account for it. The, the other thing, the other re, and the other, uh, there's actually a re, another really big thing here, actually, which is that what we don't... Um, one problem that this, the present system has is that the amount of money that's been paid to every piece of music has been has gone down every year except one since 2008 so so um what what spotify were paying per track in 2008 is nearly double than what it is now wow yeah right so so here's your problem you just put more and more music into the system and you're not putting up the price 
of the of the thing and also what you're doing is you're introducing all of this other dilution by giving away free accounts and doing these crazy family accounts where you can have six accounts for the price of one and a half which is just outrageous and you can have um you know where they're just folding them in for free and giving you six months free and this and so the, the user the average user um uh, subscription globally has gone down and down and down. So I think it's below, it's about £4.50 or something now, $4.50 per user on Spotify within the subscription model. So, and th they don't seem to care that they're doing this. And also, of course, and take into account the fact that you haven't changed the price since 2008, which means that the price in real terms in inflation has gone down by 26% as well. Uh, 9.99 in 2008 is about 13 pounds 26 now so 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 they've, they've driven down the value of music by 25 percent just with the subscription rate and they've halved the value of music within the pro rata system now user centric whatever i listen to the the, the music the, the price of music will be massively dynamic because it, if I listen to one piece of music in a month, theoretically my seven pounds should go to that one piece of music, right? So it's, it means the price of music is crazy dynamic. And, and, and that's also, I mean, that's the reason why record labels will hate it because their accountants will just be like, wait, wait, one month we make loads, next month we make nothing, next month we make loads. Like, what are we supposed to do? It'd be like, deal with it. Um, but the, the <laughs> but, um, I mean, that's obviously a very good reason why they'd hate it. But, but um, it, 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 it means that with every new user, all that happens is the, the, they, are, they are purely additive. They just, the music they listen to gets that money. You're not, you're not in this situation where the total value of all music is being driven down all the time. Assuming that this room that, that, that we are, the virtual room that we are in at the moment is full of music lovers, what is the advice, what is the, the, what is the takeaway that you would like them to take out into the wider world about how this broken record situation can be solved? What can we, as lovers of music, do ourselves to help this situation? Um, I think there's different things that you can do. I mean, you can... Uh, there's, you can speak to your MP or your le whoever your local legislator is about um, the fact that you feel like the system is exploitative and unregulated. That, and as a citizen, you can say that you don't like the, the fact that your that, that your money goes to music that you don't listen to, and you feel that your rights as a consumer are being broken. You can um, speak to your pension or any, who, anyone, if you have any money invested anyway, you can speak to the, the, any way you have money invested and say that you don't want your income, money to be invested in these companies if they are, haven't changed their behaviors. Um, I think that's a very powerful thing to do. Um, where possible, I think it, right now, it's worth thinking about buying your music at Bandcamp and places like that. Um, if you can't get it there, then fair enough. But you know, uh, most good indie music is available on Bandcamp, and you can pay direct for it. You can give your money if you do buy physical records. At, or by all means, go and shop at your local beautiful independent record store. But if you haven't got a local little indie store, buy direct from the artists. Artists are the retailers and do a lot of um, direct to customer sales from that will have an internet shop of their own so please buy from them because they'll make the retail money when that happens a lot of the time they won't be making money from their label but they'll make money as the retailer <laughs> so um so it's well worth going doing that um you know right at the moment it's it's tough you know buy a t-shirt <laughs> so get, chuck a little bit of money uh, your favorite musicians uh, way if you can um, most of them aren't as as wealthy as you might think and is there any social media activity that they can they can uh, undertake that would help the campaign as well that you would encourage follow f follow me on twitter um at mr tom gray with an a and um you know if you if you want to support the campaign you can write Hashtag broken record in your in your profile. 
um, you know, you can retweet the things that are being shared uh, by the artists and amplify this and, you know, uh, and retweet them to your local MPs or legislators or whatever you have in your region and sort of, and bring everybody into this conversation because that's, that's the thing is trying to really, uh, is not, I don't want to have this conversation within industry. I want to have this conversation directly with music lovers, directly with consumers and, and with legislators. I don't want, it, it can't be this internal, um, you know, um, just echo chamber anymore. People really need to get that the music industry is broken. Well, Tom, I'd like to thank you very much um, for what I think has been a, like a genuinely inspiring conversation. I really hope that this, uh, you know, accelerates some change, and especially at a time when musicians are quite clearly suffering more than ever before. Um, so, yeah, best of luck with the campaign. And, you know, thanks for taking the time. Oh, thank you so much, Wendell. It's been brilliant. Thank you.